All right, everyone. Welcome once again to Faces of Business. I'm your host, Damon Pistolka. With me today, I've got Chris Locken. How are you doing today, Chris? I'm doing awesome, Damon. It's awesome to be here. Man, I'm excited for us to be here today. You know, we're going to be talking about innovative employee benefit solutions. We're going to get to that a little bit later. And you you are an expert among, I don't know, very few that do this stuff. And it's going to be cool to talk about those kind of things as we as we get into that. But before we got on, we were talking about a couple of things because you're from the Wisconsin, kind of Minneapolis, St. Paul area. Mm -hmm. And yep. there's an important matchup coming this week and, and not so important for, for, for my team, but for your team, because you guys need to keep winning. The, <laughs> the Green Bay Packers are, are playing the Seahawks this weekend. So that's going to be a good one. It's, it's always, it's, it's our non-division rivalry that people get fired up for. It actually used to be the Cowboys, I think, but now the Seahawks and having the, the, pleasure to go to the uh, last playoff game uh, at Lambeau and it was it was awesome and yeah w and the, the funny thing for us out here is the Seahawks quarterback is we consider him our own so you know he's, yeah 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 my the Seattle Seahawks are my wife's second favorite football team first because of the uniforms and secondly because of Russell Wilson <laughs> yeah <So. laughs> yeah <clears throat> That's right, because I forget about it. He's a Wisconsin guy. You know, he could have played baseball. It's just a bunch of well, a lot of the lot of quarterbacks could technically have played baseball too. But yeah, yeah, that's something. But we got so it's a matchup. Doesn't really mean much for the Seahawks. I mean, maybe it'll mean we can kind of maybe get to the playoffs if we're lucky. But the the Packers. I mean, you guys got a legitimate shot this year, doing really well. Uh, it, it's actually pretty impressive with even our special teams last <laughs> week were atrocious um but the uh the, with the, how the defense has kind of come together this is a this this has a different feeling even than it did last year after the uh mr brady's uh, debacle at lambo there well yeah the debacle with mr brady at lambo i guess that's probably the right way to say it so, <laughs> yeah 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 well that's cool so it'll be fun and you're going to be at the game you said this week uh yes i have the i have the fortunate pleasure to get there so yeah uh -huh. it's, it'll be fun it's oh. it might even be snowing again because it was snowing the last time it might even be snowing this time so that's yeah it's a little early for snow but there's nothing like lambo in the snow so there you that's go that's for sure that's for sure well that's <laughs> one of the stadiums on my bucket list to get to man because i think that would be a great place yeah so oh we got steve rice in the room hey. all right steve and he said, oh, the Ducks are grudging and Myers of Russell Wilson because he beat us in the Rose Bowl. Okay. Yes. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a he's got a, a great college and great professional history. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, we were talking about it a little bit about how how well he does in terms of just yeah. how he's always just he hasn't changed. Right. He just works really hard. And it's, it's a great it's a great story. I mean, it's I was reading a little bit this week about. Matt Flynn, when Matt Flynn got signed by the Seattle Seahawks and the Green Bay Packers by Mike Holmgren, um, he he was going to be a starting quarterback. He, yeah. he he started like two games. He, he was he was gone. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that's amazing what Russell's been able to do. So yeah, yeah, and it is it is you know because you look at him and you look at size wise shouldn't be a quarterback. You look at a lot of things he shouldn't be, but he he did he does, and that's the main thing. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. yeah, and and he's fun to watch as long as he's not playing your team. <laughs> that's for sure that's for sure <laughs> there's been a lot of them i mean i mean we were talking about before we got on you go okay there's there's the the you know we we've won i think the last day i can't remember when we won the nfc championship against the, the packers yep. that was a good one for the seahawks and then the one that i remember and we talked about before we got on is when the packers were playing in seattle and you reminded me that it was when they had the replacement officiating and i had actually with my buddy we had gone to the game and and it's like oh we're losing we walk out of the stadium and we're about halfway down the place to find a place to have a beer before we um you know pack up and and head out and the stadium erupts and all of a sudden we won the game. And, and when you go back and you look and you're like, boy, that was pretty questionable for us to do that. And then to be able to keep going. <laughs> no, it, uh, 
that, that again, remember everybody, it's it's a long time ago now because people it forget is. that that was the end. That was the last game that the replacement officials worked, and I and all of the dis, all of the disagreements and everything were gone. I think by by Tuesday at like four o'clock, it was done. Yeah, I, I think yeah. it was over at that point in time. But, yeah, the, yeah. The, the regular officials made their case. That yeah, was exactly. Real, that was real yeah. quick. Real yeah, and 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 the and the and the funny inside backstory of that is is all of those officials were either in where a lot of them were in college and many of them never came never came back because what they told you once you went up, you you mm-hmm. probably won't be brought back down. You won't be able to come back to NCAA. So oh. there was a there was a big uh, there was a big turnover that happened there. Not everybody did that happen to, but there were a number of the the Division One college assigners that were a little upset that they left, knowing we have Division One college games, which create that's the one thing that happens when somebody goes yeah, up. Create, you got to you got to fill the hole, right? Yep. And then it creates this chain. And if you don't have enough trained people and things like that. That's that's kind of how the business works. The business of officiating works is it, it can get everybody kind of suffers along the way, and you got to find spots to fill in holes. And you know, there are some pretty intense NCAA Division One games going on every week too. You know, yeah. and if you're taking guys off of or guys and gals off of those games, it can be challenging too. So that's yeah. for sure. That's for sure. Well, let's start. Let's start. Let's back up a little bit, Chris, and talk about your background because when we when we talk about we're going to talk about uh, employee benefit solutions in in just a second, but kind of give us a little bit of history about how did you really get into uh, what you're doing now, and mm-hmm. and what really led you here today? Yeah, well, uh, the the the. St- the interesting thing about people who work in the, in kind of in the benefits and insurance world is most people tell you on these types of things, they go to you and they say, you know, Damon, I really didn't plan to be here, right? I didn't, I didn't come out wanting to do this when I left my, my, my post high school education. Well, the interesting thing is, is for me, I actually started in the insurance business in college. I was an intern. Um, I worked in the individual, in more the individual life and disability business. I actually enjoyed the heck out of it, um, and ultimately, kind of found some 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 a path in it. Um, I have a background in a lot of critical thinking and economics, so it was always helping me to kind of, you know, engage my brain in that level and solve problems a little bit differently. Um, and then, you know, insurance is kind of a very important thing. I kind of go back to my my mom when she was growing up. My grandfather was a, a dairy farmer here in Wisconsin, and my grandmother was in the hospital for a very long time and two, three, four weeks um, with a medical condition. And they didn't have health insurance back then. And it was a tough time. You know, dollars were scarce. Uh, you know, anytime in the farming world, dollars are scarce, it seems like. And oh, yeah. uh, so, yeah. so, you know, there was a point in time that there was very close to the things, things not going well there. So it was always something important that was always kind of ingrained in me as a kid. And I kind of look at it now and go, no, I landed. Everything happens for a reason. You land in the right place. So that's, it, it, I didn't figure that out when I was in my college thing. I was like, this is really, I like doing this. Right. And, uh, and then as I moved through that, there's a, when you're working with individuals and you're, uh, really younger in that type of business, you you have a lot of people who aren't necessarily have the whole, all of the commitments that they have as you get along later in life. So it's like, yeah, I'm going to spend X amount on that with you, or I'm going to have money to go out and, you know, go to concerts and, and drink beer and, things like that. Yeah. They, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it, it was a little, it was a little bit of a, uh, an awakening for me when I kind of set out after school to get, stay in that type of field. Um, but what I found is I started calling on business owners because I was like, business owners bought, have to protect their businesses. So they'd come in and go, okay, you're, you, you got some good things here. Yeah. I don't want to talk about that, but you know what? I got, I got these benefits and they're expensive and I'm tired of it. Can you do something about this? So literally here you are working in this environment where it's built on the individual basis. You're trying to find individual business owners to kind of work with them. And here they're asking you to solve a completely different pro- uh, problem, right? And so with that, that's kind of where my direction led. I worked uh, I worked in the world of 
the big insurance company, you know, one of those ones that might have a blue logo, the second most logo, second there most knowledgeable logo than Coca-Cola in the world, right? That might be, yeah. that it might have changed now, but back in yeah. the day, yeah. um, I learned a lot of things there. Um, and I'll tell you that I started to, I always tell everybody, I was starting to run into the walls. And when I ran into the walls, I started telling people what I thought. And, you know, it was one of those where I realized my life was probably not going to be, I would not be sitting in there for the majority of my career. But I was also working with people who do what I do now. And I said, wait a second, we just, we just worked our butts off to give you a, you know, a, a solution. There's a lot of money involved in these things. And, you know, it was, it was a lot less money to then than it is today because in the time of doing this probably has gone all of this stuff's gone up at least 300 percent in price um <clears throat> yeah that's but crazy. you're not you're not you're not you're not you're not why did what happened well we went and did this and we went and did that okay did you even explain what we were doing did you explain the strategy i gave you on the back well yeah chris but y y you don't know what you're doing you're you're 23 Five, 26 year old punk kid, right? You know, so I, 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 I had a unfortunate restructuring, you know, those things in your, yep. when you're, when you're, we've, your all had them. When, we've all had them, but when you're in like, you're in your mid twenties, you're like, Whoa, what's going on? Is this really how this is going down? Uh, I, it was maybe my later twenties, but anyway, so I said, you know what? It's time. It's time to go. Um, what I did is I worked with a work. I had a large, I had a lot of opportunities out of that. People had, kind of noticed what I was doing. And then I um, went with a large national agency. We, I, I had to kind of ended up having to kind of train myself. Um, and uh, so that, that just kind of ended oddly with management changes and things like that. And then what I did is I basically said at the end of that conversation, I said, I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to find the place that's home for a while. Because I like that consistency and that background. And that's kind of how I came to work with who I work with now at the folks at Johnson. And, and we're, we could go into, we could go into a long dissertation on who they are. Um, but you know, they're, they're one of the greatest families in American business out of Racine, Wisconsin. You know, they've six nice. generations are running, running a wax company, the old wax company, you know, and, yeah. and now it's, you know, Ziploc and, and those types of things. And then, you know, 50 years ago, they started a financial services division and we work with that. So, yeah, and it's a fantastic story and absolutely wonderful people uh, from that thing. So you find it, you find oh, a home, cool. you know, you know, yeah. so. Yeah, it's so that's, cool. That's a, and and to listen to you tell about the 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 place where you work, it's just it's really nice because you don't find that many people. There's there's so many people that hey, I go to work for a, this company or that company, and they're really not they they don't have a lot to say about the company. But hearing you talk about the company itself, that's really cool. Yeah, well, and you know, business is hard. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just telling you, it's hard. Yeah. To, to, to do it for six generations and not lose your hind end is pretty yeah. impressive. That but the other true. thing is, is they've done, they did some things and you, you know, not, they haven't been perfect. Right. Especially in our financial service division, there was a, some situations about 10 years ago. Um, and they were going to, they had to make some tough decisions. The interesting thing in the decisions was they looked at everybody that they trusted, which was their people and said, we're going to, we're going to bet our own money on you. We're not going to bet somebody else's money on you. That's big, especially today in our world of mergers and acquisitions and private equity and venture capital and all those things, all those things that you work in all the time. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, you know, yeah. but it's one of those things where everybody like in our business, people just keep getting bigger, right? The big guys yeah. at the top keep buying the little guys at the bottom. Yeah. And yeah. there's no, there's at the end of the discussion, it just becomes this never ending churn to get to the, to the revenue number. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and to be able to have a little bit of space in there and be able to say, Hey, we got your back on that a little bit is nice. Not that we don't have churn. Yeah, not yeah. That we don't need revenue numbers. You can't yeah. run a dang business doing it that yeah. way, but it's, yeah. it, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty but you cool. don't, so. you don't, it doesn't have to be your sole focus. I mean, right. and that's the thing that's nice. And that's, it's part of the reason why, you know, as, as I've mentioned before in my career, got, got out of working in those kind of businesses. We, we like to deal with, uh, and help our clients, uh, sell businesses to those kind of buyers because they do have money and they do that. But it's, uh, it is nice, as you say, to work for a company that, that doesn't have to, um, rely solely on the investor's money. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's, and we've, yeah, we were able to leverage that. How yeah. we're able to take that personalized approach. I, I now want to take that down to my, you know, ground level here. We're able yeah. to be much more personalized um, and then be able to, to, to do things a little bit differently than some of, some of the other folks that are doing what we do, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. So for, for people that don't understand, and I'm, I'm going to ask some questions too, because I don't sure. know Absolutely. exactly. So when we talk about some of the innovative benefit solutions that you're doing, are these primarily focused around people that are, that are choosing to do, and correct me if I'm using the wrong terminology, self-insurance for their business? Yes and no. I, I'll be fair because yeah, yeah. there's a, you know, there's a lot of people running around and they are wonderful people. That I, I try to be very open source and learn. I don't get yeah. any better if I don't learn anything every day. Right. Yeah. Hopefully I learn more than one thing every day, but you got to have, you got to start somewhere. Right. Yeah. But there's a lot of talk about self-funding and those kinds of things. There are, Yes, there's a ton of innovation in that space right now. But the interesting thing is, is when we've started building out our practice, we said, how do we just be innovative all the way around? Because sometimes it's not the, it's not what you, what you buy off the shelf. It's how you use it in terms of things. You know, there's a lot. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a funding strategy of I'm buying from my big, you know, my Blue Cross, my United Healthcare, those types of things, uh, or my local regional provider owned sponsored health plan like an HMO or something like that. Uh, it, 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 you can do some things inside of those situations. The challenge is, is to really understand the business. How do you want to do this as a business owner? Because yes, there's business owners that want to try everything to save every dollar on this they can and spend it efficiently and effectively. But sometimes they go, you know what? We just really want to do this well. We want to invest in this and do that. So what we take it back is say, okay, let's come up with our, our plan. What do you want to have happen? What does this look like from a business case perspective? And then let's apply the things accordingly. Now, will I be, if, if, if it's Chris Loken's philosophy only are what is self-funding a heck of a lot way to be a lot more innovative the answer to that question is absolutely <laughs> you know but it's you know so my my bias is probably a little bit more towards let's let's get in here rip this apart and see what we can do do things a little bit differently because some of those other models don't necessarily provide you the best outcome from time to time so that's that's great to know because it, it is it is really you said one thing in here and you said the business case because I think there are some business owners are gonna look at that benefit line and gonna go, it's a cost. They're mm -hmm. gonna say it's just it's a sunk cost, I throw it away, I, I gotta provide it, blah blah blah. And there's other business owners that look at it and go, if I can do this right it's going to help me recruit and retrain the best people. Correct. And now do you really see when you, when they take that second approach, does that two questions? One, do you think that that helps? I mean, I know you're not an HR in those businesses, but do you really feel that that helps them retain the employees and recruit the employees a little bit better? I would say yes. I, I think when you take it on as this is part of what we're doing as part, it, it has to fit into what your cult, it, it also lies into what your culture is. You know, if it's here, if a culture is, Hey, you're here to make parts, we're here to give you salary and health insurance benefits. And that's the way it is. It's an, and the benefits part is really a necessary evil for me to get my parts out the door. Right. Well, that's not a culture that a lot of people are going to want to hang out in. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's now, true. if we come to them and say, we care about you and your, your family, if they have a family, we care about you. We want you to be able to, you know, when you work hard for us, we want you to be able to play hard too, you know, especially as long yeah. as you can. Right. That's yeah. the kind of thing I always think about. I get in front of a meeting of people. I go, hey, hey these benefits are here so you can, you work hard here. We want yeah. you to be able to play hard as long as you can, right? We yeah. want you to be able, when you make your money and you retire, awesome. you can, you can enjoy your health because you didn't, you know, you didn't, you didn't have the way to pay for it, right? There's a yeah. different way to think about that. What that comes down to is culture, right? And those, 
the the scary part about it is is we've kind of you know, especially in the Midwest where I spend a lot of my time, we kind of have this good old fashioned um, Midwest work ethic, right? You walk into the walk into the plant and everybody's just grinding, right? And you go, how much do these people make? And you look at them and go, wow, they're working hard for that much money. That's not a that I'm going, I'm that's not a lot of money, but it's that work ethic, right? We think I think a lot of companies, you know, business owners, CEOs look at it and go, we can work our way out of the problem, right? We'll just go make more stuff, sell more stuff, right? That's what I think they've kind of tried to do. But ultimately, are those decisions that have been made around that, I think now are starting to bring people back to, okay, what's our culture look like? How do we start really taking better care of our people? Because, well, if you look at anything in the machining trades these days, the average age of a machinist in the United States is 58 years old. So yeah. we got to figure we got to figure out how to make this a lot cooler for for the younger people to get them in the door, you know, because we've kind of lost that in our spot. So I don't I think that answered your question. I might have. Oh, it was great. A little was, bit it, no, no, dude, that was great. <laughs> that was great because it was it was I mean, because it really is. And you you brought it back to where where I needed to hear it. And not because I thought we were going there, but it's awesome because it really is about keeping people healthy longer in and outside of work, first of all. And, mm -hmm. and so they, so they, so they can be there longer at work and off of work. And, and, mm -hmm. and like you said, enjoy their life. So it's really about that culture rather than it, the benefits being a necessary evil. It's just another way to, to keep a healthy, happy workforce. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's just, that's, that's awesome because when you look at it, and this was this was going to be one of my next questions about it. When you look at it and you go, okay, within reason, if somebody does this, right? And they go, okay, I'm I'm the person on this side, and I'm I'm a necessary evil person. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, necessary evil. I'm going to give them, you know, middle of the road benefits. Mm -hmm. Then I look at the person that's on the other side of this and says, hey, I I want to really help to drive my culture with this. Our, and and. You know, I'm not looking for exact numbers or anything, but is this crazy expensive compared to on a per person kind of basis? Or is it like, you know, you look at it and you go, if I want to invest in that, that's probably what I should do. Well, now there's that number's a, a lot different than a lot of people. That's a mind, very layered, that's a very <laughs> layered question, Damon. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. But I, but okay, but, so but I know you where that. you're going. I know where you're going with this, yeah, right? Yeah. If I'm just, hey, get me in, get me the cheapest thing you can, right? And we're going to beat it up and we're going to do this. We're going to do that. But then it's just always a dollar sign. I'm going to yeah. tell you some impacts of that. And then I'm going to go the other way. Okay? okay, good. And the funny thing is, is I think the, the, the strategy it's going to be kind of funny how this is going to work out when I, when I'm done with this. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. All right. So, so if I come in and I just, what's, what's happened, let's take how that's being done. If you're that person, there's thousands of examples out there where, what do we do when we come in and go, okay, this is a necessarily, we got to have it so we can say when they come in the door and we offer them X amount of dollars an hour, we got, we got X, Y, and Z, they can check the boxes and we don't talk about the plan, right? We're just going to go straight yeah. down a road. Well, what happens is, is you go, wow, okay, well, healthcare costs, remember, are the, 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 it's a finance mechanism, right? Yeah. We're buying healthcare services. Healthcare services in this country go up about anywhere between six and 10% a year. That's, and that's before some of the inflationary winds that have yep. been blowing this year. How, yeah. how we're in this, this, it's like, Oh, inflation went up 6% in October. I went, well, welcome to healthcare, like every year for the last yeah. forever, right? Yeah. So we're buying, so when I, I go to that strategy, I'm buying something that's more expensive every year. I'm financing something that's more expensive every year in that strategy. So what am I doing? I'm going, I'm paying more to purchase the financing mechanism. And I'm guessing I'm adjusting those terms because I don't want to pay too much more. So yeah. what does that happen? Well, I got two. I got two hydraulics to play with there. I got premium costs to me, to me as a company or employer, or how I invest in it. If it's a self self fund, it gets a little more complicated. We talk about the premium costs, but yeah. we'll stay out of that. I have that upfront investment in the financing strategy, and I have how the financing strategy works throughout the course of the year, which is those things that we pay when we go to the doctor, deductibles, 
co-payments, those kinds of things. Well, the funny thing is, is all we've done is we've tried to always play the hydraulics game, premiums and this to try to make the budget work. Yeah. What has it done? Well, now people have deductibles that they really can't afford. Yeah. Okay. You have five, we have people making $15 an hour with a $5,000 deductible. Well, um, <clears throat> most average Americans have $400 in their savings account right now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So how is that going to work when I need to go take care of something? Right. More than likely, unless it's an absolute all out emergency, I'm probably going to delay care. Yeah. I'm probably going to wait till it gets really bad. Right. So it kind of becomes this and I'll, I'll tie this back in to the, the other way of doing it where we say, hey, wait a second, that model is flawed. And I will tell you, we've you learn a lot by doing right. We yeah. w- what we've come to from that discussion lately is, is that some of the things that we were doing with these bigger deductibles on people with you going, well, it's just the way we got to make it work. What we found is, is that's not working for people. They're afraid to get sick and they're afraid that they're, yeah. they, they're going to go bankrupt. Well, that's why you have health insurance, right? So yeah. if you embrace that as an employer and say, it's part of our culture to really take care of you and your family, we're going to, we're going to structure our plan based upon this. And we're going to educate you on what's going on out there. I think that's the biggest thing is getting people to understand how things work because nobody wants to do it. Nobody wants to go get health care for the most part. We don't want to be there when we're sick or mm-hmm. yeah, hurt. Yeah. Nobody yeah. wants this stuff. So, but we're going to teach you that. And then the other thing is, is don't you get really frustrated when it seems like the doctor brings you back six times for that hangnail we'll use as a very yeah. easy, easy way. Well, here's, here's some things we're going to put into our program. Here's some solutions we're going to put in to help you better understand what's going on out there. And it's amazing. And then if you do some things and you pay attention because the difference between Dr. A, Dr. B, and Dr. C, you know, Dr. A could do it for $14,000, could do that knee replacement for you. And he works on professional sports teams. Dr. Dr. C could do it for 60000 and he he's just the guy that graduated last from his class in medical school. And you got Dr. B in the middle that everybody kind of thinks is a really nice guy. Well, he's 30000 right? Yeah. But you know, the problem is, is those cost numbers also relate to the quality numbers. The lowest cost provider is usually the highest cost provider because they've got the most reps. If you can get your, I always tie everything back to, to learning about precision manufacturing. So I, it fascinates me, right? I'm not mechanical at all. I have no marketable skills, in it. but you wouldn't, you wouldn't, some of the things that we see in healthcare, you would not, those would not be acceptable tolerances on the shop floor. Oh, and, yeah, in fact, yeah. and in fact, if I, if, if I went out and produced something out to the, the, the Dr. C tolerance, I wouldn't have a job next week, right? So it's one of those yeah. situations where teaching people that there are those differences, giving them the guidance to do that, it's interesting because you're taking care of you're taking care of them. You're giving them a benefit. And the weird part about it is we're probably spending more on this the, the uh, necessary evil side. We end up spending more than we would spend on that sp- in that area where we're taking care of people and helping them better understand a system and they putting financial incentives behind them so they can go afford, they aren't going to go bankrupt or concerned that they're going to not be able to pay the bill, you know? Yeah. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the way you can work with it. See, how'd I do? That's awesome. That's incredible, (laughs) man. Because I think, I think you're right. It's like a lot of things you just look, if you just look at the number and go, okay, but you're talking about, behind the numbers and this is i mean months ago we had these conversations and i thought that's why i was so excited that when you said you wanted to do this because you know it's not about you you said one thing that i think most people don't even fail to consider three doctors all different prices to do the same knee replacement correct people don't even know you got that choice right because i'll tell you until my wife who was in the healthcare industry (laughs) told me that i had that choice until then, Dr. A said, you need to go to Dr. B. I went to Dr. B. Dr. B could be the hor- most horrible, highest cost, mm-hmm. worst care. I wouldn't have known. I would just know that I got referred there. That's who I got to go. Now it's you, you're researching. You're looking at those kind of things. You're figuring out. 
is it really the right place? Is and and like you said, am I going back seven times for a hangnail when I don't have the doctors talking? Mm-hmm. And right. and you know, just the kind of things that you have to do as a patient, and the kind of things you look at, you have to look at it, how they work together. And I can see how you're you can come up with lower costs with better care. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and the best part about it is, is let's go back to what we said we had the benefits for. Work hard, play hard. You get yeah. back to playing harder when you don't have complications from a surgery. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I'm I'm not a I'm not a I'm not a good patient myself. Yeah. Right. Just ask my wife, right? If I'm sick, yeah. if I'm sick, like a day of sick, I'm just I'm a I'm I'm a puddle. Like I'm just yeah. like I'm, but I don't get sick very often, which is, yeah. I'm very, very fortunate, but it's, it's one of those where it is, um, y- you know, it's people don't understand that that could be the difference. Right. Yeah. And when you listen, if you talk to people about how frustrating it is, they, cause when you have like bone, bone and joint type surgeries, you're usually in a heck of a lot of pain, right? You're, you're like, get this, you're ready to cut off your leg, yep. right? Instead of, instead of get the joint replaced. And then, I mean, people, when they get it done, they don't even need painkillers half the time because they've been in so much pain previously. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You just, so unfortunately we don't take that step and go, Hey, wait a second. Wait a second. This is, this is kind of a big deal. I'm replacing, yeah. I'm replacing original equipment parts. I need to be <laughs> a little smarter about this. Yeah. And that's kind of how I see it. So yeah. <laughs> that's, that's great. That, that we'll get back to that. That's awesome. I'm mean, replacing the original equipment parts. Uh, I got to write that down. That's, that's, that's awesome. Well, I just want to thank James. Hey, great to see you here, James. Thanks a lot for being here. We got Gail here too. I think, I, she's mentioning David, David, I didn't see David here. So uh, maybe David's in the crowd and I didn't see him. That's awesome. And then, uh, of course, Gail's Canadian. So we have a little different challenge there. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother week of podcasts. (laughs) Yeah. 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 (laughs) I don't know enough about it, but, but, uh, yeah, it is, it is, it is for sure. But I like that you're replacing a crit original equipment parts. Uh, yeah, because it is, it is. And, 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 you know, it's, uh, it's a fact of life anymore. There's a lot of us that decided that we were not going to play, you know, that we were going to do things that our body really wasn't meant to do when we were younger, just because engineers and other people have figured out that you can do these things doesn't mean that you should be doing them. Correct. And, and, uh, and, and just normal accidents as well, but this is awesome. So I, I want to get to a couple other personal things. We'll get back and talk about some of the, yeah, absolutely. Some of the coolest thing you're seeing, but I want to ask you, what's the funniest golfing story that you can share with us today? Oh, no. You're an avid golfer. I, I am an avid, and I'm an avid a, golfer actually, and I'm getting worse. That's the, that's the problem. I, I probably have played more in the last couple of years because of, well, last year was, was, was the thing you could do, right? Cause of COVID yeah, yeah. and everything else being shut down, you couldn't, couldn't go to any concerts. You couldn't go to, couldn't go, couldn't go do anything. Yeah. So, you know, last year I played a lot and then, uh, played, tried to play a lot this year, but I, I don't know what's going on. I've got a, I actually might even have to go see a professional. Um, so, uh, I've usually been able to fix it, but I started a long time ago. Probably the funniest golfing story is the first, I think the first round I played golf ever, I was 14 years old and up in, up in Northern Wisconsin, which it's, you know, usually about 38 degrees uh, when we first get on a course, Uh, a a lot like it is today here in, in the lovely Midwest, we are experiencing a Seattle day. I call it, it's just raining all dang day. Um, um, But anyway, so it's one of those things. And, and uh, my, my, my little home course, my little hometown in, uh, and I'm, I'm doing okay. Right. I'm kind of dragging around, but this, cause this is, it's different. I'd never played golf before. I picked up a golf club at 14 years old. So I don't want to join yeah. the high school golf team. Right. That's what I did. Nice. So I took a 36 on one hole because <laughs> I was follow because we were told to follow the rules. Right. I had like, yeah. I think I shot 135 and I, sh- I had a 36 on one hole because I could not get my drive to go over this little uh, inlet ravine of water so oh, that's yeah. that's that's how it began that's it's actually funny because most people would be smart enough to probably quit then but i did yeah. not so there yeah. you go <laughs> that, that is... <laughs> oh yeah. you know that's awesome 
That's I, awesome. it, and the problem is that's like the first one that came to mind. So that might be the best one. I'm not sure. There's, there's quite a few yeah. good ones out there, but well, uh, they're, they're, <laughs> the people don't really understand in the North in the Northern part of the United States, there's some really beautiful golf courses. There really are. Uh, yeah. And you know, if you can get to them between the seasons of, uh, you know, winter and mosquito season, you're yeah. pretty good. But, yeah. and, and there, there, but there are, there's a lot of lovely places oh, we've, to play. Well, like just in the state of Wisconsin, I mean, you look at the quality of golf in this state compared to, even compared to what it was when I was a kid, right. When I was yeah. in high school, yeah. you know, we have, we have Aaron Hills, we didn't have whistling straights and, and the black wolf run. And now the group, now there's another group in the central Wisconsin that's got three or four really fantastic courses, uh, the sand Valley people. We have, there's, there's a lot of golf here in Wisconsin and, and, and same thing when you go to Minnesota or you go to Michigan. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's pretty, um, it's, it's pretty, uh, awesome here. And it's amazing that they, some of these courses look as nice as they do, you know, with the fact that they're covered with snow for three or four months, you yeah. know, so. <laughs> in some ways that might help them because I think, I think a lot of the courses in the, in the deep South, they were played all hard all year round. And, yep. and I remember when I lived down there, that's what you'd see is they just get, they'd get that traffic all year. The mm-hmm. ones in the North get to rest a bit. Yeah. So that's cool. Yeah. And I actually live on a golf course. So I, I, I literally today mm-hmm. it is colder than, the, it is yeah. that we we have when you get this rain and stuff where we live and in the wind and it's like oh no yeah and and by the way it's the uh it's the day after the wreck of the edmund fitzgerald so the gales of november you know are already here yeah. Yeah. uh and uh and it's like i I'm, I'm sitting here watching doing some work this afternoon and i go what in the heck is going there are two guys out playing one of them was in shorts so there you go <laughs> i'm it's not wisconsin. that crazy <laughs> it's wisconsin <laughs> that's awesome though that's awesome that's awesome well we got matt in the house that said we were talking about you earlier matt so uh and we'll talk about you more as we get on and and matt of course is a is a a seahawks fan if you can't tell no (laughs) no a little bit a little diehard packer fan there and that's awesome but uh I, and, I, and if Matt didn't hear, hear it earlier, I think that the, the Seahawks are going to have a tough road this week, this weekend. It's going to be hard. But, uh, yeah, you know, they, my my funniest golf story, and I, I just remembered as I was coming in here, is I was playing in a – and I, 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 was, I was so fortunate. I didn't take up golfing until I was in college, right? And I started in business. And mm-hmm. I was like, golfing? I never golfed before. So I go out and golf. And for people that grow up where there's uh, like, I grew up in South Dakota, right? So it's, it's flat, it's flat Mm -hmm. and it's dry. So you go out on some of these country courses, you can hit the ball. It just keeps bouncing and going. And Mm -hmm. you know, that was kind of fun and there was no trees. So, but the, uh, I was really lucky that I lived on a, I lived on a lake up there uh, shortly after college in outside of Brookings and it was at the mm-hmm. Brookings country club and that beautiful 18 hole course on the lake, 300 members. And there were, there were, uh, most of them were, were nearing retirement age. So I would get done with work and I could go out there and play just with no one else on the course, literally you know, five, six people on 18 holes. Mm-hmm. And, it, it, and it was, it was absolutely in, insane. And of course you never keep score. Mm-hmm. So you come you know, my scorecard says something and golfers and know that your handicap or whatever, I forget what it's here. It says, yeah. and uh, my handicap wasn't quite that, but yeah. you come to a tournament. That's what you have to show is you show your card. Right. Yep. And uh, that was always funny because uh, people would people would go, "Hey, you're gonna be on my team? You're gonna be on my team? Going my team?" Because they see I was the golf club rat, you know, that was around yep. out there playing golf all the time. Yep. But we were in a we were in a uh, a best ball tournament, and we were at one of the one of the holes that I forget what it was, what hole it was, but we were standing there, and and we were like a, a seventy yards away from the the pin, and it was up over the hill, and you couldn't see it. But I played it a lot, right? Played it a lot. So I, I told, I told somebody in the, in the group that I knew and I was playing with some friends, I said, I'm going to make this. They're like, what? I said, yeah. And then for some reason, I just felt like I'm going to make it. And I, I <laughs> I'll be damned. I go, I hit the ball, hit the ball. Nice. It went up there and we got up there. We couldn't find the ball. 
<laughs> and and I said, I must have hit it too hard. We're looking around back and somebody walks up, pulls it out of the hole. That, that's a fun <laughs> that was a funniest story. Anyway, I wasn't that great a golfer, but it was still funny. Hey, anytime you call your shot, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but it was good, good stuff. But yeah, the, the golfing is golfing is a as you do, and you say you're getting worse. It, it's one of those things that you really need to take it with the right attitude, because man, yep. it's it's anger will just kill you. Yeah, it's in and, and literally, uh, it probably is your mine is probably it was often said many times the secret to golf is managing the eight inches of green space between your ears. Right. I think, I think what happened to me a lot this year was I started to press. Right. And then you press, you don't play well. You know, yeah. And you, you know, when you listen to the PGA tour guys, I spent a lot of time listening to these guys because I'm fascinated by how far these guys launch this thing, right? These little guys, they, and they're, they, they aren't any bigger than a toothpick. Yeah. You look at these guys, and you, but they go, you know, I'm only using 75% of my power. So yeah. when people say, why like, I have my normal groups play it and like, God, why am I hitting it so bad? Cause you're trying to kill it. Right. Yeah. Well, the problem is I don't, didn't do as good a job this year at taking my own advice. Right. And it, it happens. Yeah. yeah. There's always, yeah. there's always next year, you know, yeah. we'll, 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 we'll get, we'll, we'll get working on some things and we'll, we'll get it figured out next year. You know, there that's you the beauty of it. There's always yeah. another round, you know? Yeah, so. that's for sure. Well, that's funny. Cause I, my, my golfing partner back then, Dan, he was about a hundred and 50 pounds soaking wet and would would drive way past me every time yep. it's just like you said it's just smooth and smooth and and relaxed but that's cool so now another thing that you do that's kind of different and and uh you're an official for for football basketball other things yeah and you you and matt do a little of that together yeah, too. we 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 do we do uh, quite a few uh, high school varsity basketball games together yeah um sometimes Sometimes probably he's got to, you know, haul me along. So he's a little bit grudgingly on his behalf, but anyway, no, uh, it's, it's, yeah, I've, I've been doing that for, I've been doing that for 23 years. I did that right out of college. I, I, I yeah. always wanted to do it. I had, I had a couple other things that I spent time uh, outside of studies and things like, and working in college that I was doing with uh, some, some singing and some things like that. So I, I kind of never did the officiating thing. So when I got out of college, I said, okay, I'm going to do that. Right. I'd always wanted to do it. Uh, we grew up in our town. My dad, my dad was involved with all the athletics. He's plays, he was a teacher. So he yeah. was also the guy that uh, did the the clock and the scorebook and the announcing at football games and all that stuff. So I literally pretty much grew up around that is just a part of our lives yeah, so yeah. I, and oh, I, awesome. I i you know friday night when they say friday night lights that's like absolutely you lived it you right lived i lived it, it. Yeah. that was there i was like yeah. watching it and and and, and you know and basketball was basketball was kind of my 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 first sport that i really you know got to understand really really well so and officials and then i was you know we would I'd be there. I'd wait for my dad to take me home. Well, we, I got to know all the officials, right? So yeah. I just thought it was so cool that on Tuesday night they got to go watch that game, and on Monday night they got to go watch that game, and on Thursday they got to go watch that game, and then Friday they came to our town, right? Or you know, and and I just thought that was fast. I was like, you mean they get to go like watch like four or five basketball games a week? And that's like when you're like six or seven, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Right? What well, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. They get a car and they get to go do this and whatever. Well, it's it. So it, I just always wanted to do it. I started because. Um, my sister was a, a few years younger than me. She was playing basketball at the high school level and kind of didn't really understand why these guys didn't call the game better. And, you know, that whole kind of <laughs> like, hey, ref, what's going on? You're you're terrible. Right. That thing. Right. I've you know. And uh, and so I'm like, OK, you know what? You're 23 years old. You've always wanted to do this you're going to need to figure this out. How are you going to do this? So the, the best part about this is, is I, there was an officiating class and this, the gentleman who ran the officiating class is a very accomplished official in the state of Wisconsin. He's also, he also is my neighbor now three blocks down. Right. Oh wow. So whenever I, I, I not every time I see Ken, but when I see Ken every once in a while, he goes, you're still the only guy in my officiating class that walked in and said, God, darn it. If I can't do a better job, then I will shut up forever because these guys don't know what they're doing. I can do a better job. That's how I started. I had a little bit, I probably had a little bit of extra hubris as yeah. you usually do when you're 23 years old. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. but it's, um, yeah. So that's kind of how I started and just worked, 
it's a it's a process, right? It is a journey, just like anything else. Um, it's a great journey. There's it's a fantastic group of people. Uh, when when we get around and start hanging out and talking about things and telling stories, and it's like, do you, you how do you know all? How do you guys know all? each other all that well like no i just met him last week right or yeah. you know we, that kind of stuff so it's a it's a it's a it's a camaraderie there's kind of a fraternal nature to it and it's it's it, that's the best part about it and at the end of the day i can't my dad looked at me probably in my early teens and said you don't have the patience to be a teacher so you're going to need to figure something uh, something else out <laughs> but i do like to teach I do like to work with kids. I like that aspect because it's something that that my parents both uh, had a passion for. So yeah. it allows me to kind of keep that going. And I learned a crap ton of lessons. I just told you about one of them. 36 on a hole. People yeah. quit. People yeah. don't play golf after that, right? <laughs> yeah. I learned that. And you know what? I, I I'm By the time I was a senior in high school, I was on the varsity team. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's it, it, that's a life lesson. You can't teach that stuff in a classroom. And yeah. that's what I like about officiating is it allows me to stay keeping that class, what I always call the classroom between the lines and helping kids learn yeah. that. And yeah. they get upset and they got, now nah, it gets, it's weird. It's weirder yeah. than it was ever. It's weirder now yeah. than it was ever, not because of COVID or anything like that. It's parents, yeah, yeah, <laughs> mom and dads, yeah. you know, and you kind of look at them and go, you know what, just keep, you're doing a really good job tonight. Just, don't worry about what mom and dad are saying, just go. And then we had a lot of the situations. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been a very rewarding thing. And I tell, I tell you what, it gets me out of, I can spend, I can work 80 hours a week. Just ask everybody who knows me. The problem is yeah. you got to have stuff that takes your mind out of your yeah. work to be productive, you know? Yeah. So yeah. That's for sure. That's, that's for a sure. little we'll just... different. That's a little different spin on it, probably than you hear from most folks. Yeah, but, that's know. awesome. We'll, we'll talk about it just a little bit more. I just want to say thanks for Trish stopping by. She said golf. Is, oh. Twain said golf is a good walk spoiled. Yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> and then we got Rodney Canada in the house. Thanks, Rodney. Uh, Rodney uh, works over to manufacturing uh, place over here, and and uh, I I don't know if you call it Central Washington, but it's just over the mountains, and and I believe in Yakima. Nice. So that's cool. And uh, David's here. All right, got David in the room. Oh. Just want to say hello to wow. everyone. People actually that, want to hear what we have to say. I'm 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 yeah. I'm, I'm I'm like wow. <laughs> I feel I know. like yeah, uh, it's good. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome to be able to just just talk and just share stories and things and and because you know we all have interesting stories inside. So so you said something. You were, you were singing. What were you doing singing? Were you like singing out in nightclubs? What were you doing? Uh, well, no, because you're gonna have to get on yes. karaoke sometime. I'm just well, telling I, you. We're gonna I know. Get on well, we have the uh, well. Yeah. When when Ira gets that back rolling again. Yeah. Um. But uh, or or we just need to have like a meeting up and do karaoke yeah. um somewhere in the middle of the united states yeah. um but no the um no so actually i have i've always kind of been musically inclined um yeah. i my mother's dream for me was to play a music box dancer on the piano so she she slogged me through nine years of piano lessons yeah it didn't take uh <laughs> you know but but i was i could sing i music so i just kind of saying all the way through stuff um nice. and then i get to high school and they go you know you're kind of you're kind of okay at this stuff i'm like really so you know did all of those things um came came to, i actually went to the college i went to because i wanted to sing in a in a group called uh, uw eau claire which not everybody knows uh singing statesman and it's a it's a world-renowned men's chorus okay wow. so it sounds kind of like okay that's kind of different right but uh, they 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 just was always a there was always a high uh, high level organization so i kind of uh, cool. you know learned kind of classical vocal training and you learned all that stuff and then i went i actually went to the university and didn't start with those guys i took me a couple years to get to make it work into my schedule but then um we got to go, I got to go to, I got to go to Europe twice and sing in, wow. you know, cathedrals. And, yeah. you know, I kind of, one of my lines is, is, you know, hey, how many of you have sung a high mass at Dom Zeus Salzburg on a Sunday morning? Oh, well, not man. a lot of people get to sing in, you know, Salzburg Cathedral in the morning, you know, and it's, yeah. and it's, it's, it, you know, and it was a, it's a great group of people. Uh, most of those, a lot of those people are the people from my 
formative years, if you will, that I stay in touch with the most, you oh, know, nice. and, you know, it's funny, the stories, the stories stay the same and it's, it's a great group of guys and, and we've, you know, we, we're always together in terms of things. So yeah, I sang quite a bit in college. That was my, that was one of those, like my, 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 one of the things we did. So yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah. So no doubt. now it's just limited to karaoke bars and, you know, that kind of thing. Although that is how I met my wife. So there you go. <laughs> oh, awesome. Awesome. Well, you must've been pretty good because a, to get in the, into the, into the, with the other course yeah. too, but then yeah. to attract your wife. It well, can't be that bad. Well, you know, yeah, exactly. Well, there's, there's a lot, there's probably a, another story that if we yeah. had a, you know, this wasn't necessarily somewhat professional. There. I could tell you <laughs> on how, on how I, how I got to be a lot better croaky singer, but we'll just leave that out for today. There we go. <laughs> there we go. That will be for another time. Another time right there. Cause it's, you know, it's, it's when, when you hear about you and learn about you, uh, the golf, the officiating, and then the, from the, the, the parent raising, raising the uh, parents that were educators and stuff, it really brings full circle why you like to help people with benefits the way you do and why you like to really understand, you know, the medical business and how to really help people do uh, have more effective benefit solutions for their employees. So their employees can, can lead happier and healthier lives. It, you can really understand that after you hear, hear more about you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, that's cool. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's, you, life is short. Yeah. I, every year I turn around the sun, I go, good Lord, yeah. I'm that old now. Right. I mean, faster too. we don't have, so we have an expiration date, sadly. Yeah. And, and yeah. sadly or not sadly, you know, depends on how you look at it, but it's, you have to, we have to do things to try to help people. Right. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is I'm businesses being successful. That's great. Right. That does a lot of things. You yeah. know, you look at, you look at certain people, you know, that might be on this podcast. Look at what that person means to n not only his community, but yeah. all a bunch of other communities around here. How yeah. do I help him not waste money on something we doesn't have to waste money on? Yeah. Right. How do we do that? So, and that's where it kind of builds into my, my thought process. Cause I think it's, we can help businesses, you know, be successful, you know, and you're, you're, you do, you do all that stuff yourself as well. We just go at it from two different angles, you know? And, so very cool because you're helping them make a bigger impact by making their employees happier and healthier mm -hmm. and, and just, man, that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Great stuff, Chris. I, oh, it's been so much fun having you on today. Yeah. I, I, just, a, I really enjoyed it. 52 minutes has gone like poof. Right. Yeah, it does. It does. And, it, 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 and man, you're, you're, you're a great guy. You really know what you're doing in the, in the benefits world. And it's awesome. And, and it's, it's so cool to hear more about you, your background, other things, because it's, it really brings things full circle. And, and I hope people uh, enjoy listening to it. I know I had a ball. I had a ball. Yeah, so it's been awesome. Thanks so much for being here again today, Chris. We're going to wrap yeah. it up for now. Hey, everyone that's listening here, we're back again next week on Tuesday and Thursday. And like always on Thursday, I forget who's coming next week. So sorry about that. But that's just me. That's the way it is. But I'm so happy today. I got Chris Loken here today. If you guys want to want to talk to Chris, meet him, whatever, just come to my profile on LinkedIn and, and got him or look him up. Chris Loken, L-O-K-K-E-N. Did I spell it right? I think I did. You did, and, uh, yes. And uh, we will, you can get a hold of him there. And we're going to be signing out for now. But thanks, everyone, for watching.